So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this beautiful morning. I'm uh, I'm out of Colorado, um, up in uh, Cripple Creek area. Anybody ever been up in that area, up in that high country up there? And we we uh, we share a lot of similar environments, I guess. I don't know why I was hoping that when I came to Utah it was going to be suddenly warmer. Uh, I had no idea what I was thinking. But I'm not that far from you, and uh, I, I, I've kind of resided there for a long time. Does, does anybody feel like this this morning? Okay. Have, you must be from Colorado because we're pretty high um, on what we do over there. As you know, we've recently passed the uh, marijuana bill. Um, and a lot of states across the country now are watching us and seeing how that's going to materialize as far as a lot of, a lot of things, not only economically, but... Uh, and from an emergency medical standpoint, we were wondering how that was going to impact us. How do you think that uh, came across so far? Well, we're not seeing assaults like we used to see. We're not seeing high-speed accidents. In fact, people are driving and hitting themselves at 10 miles an hour. So it's really nothing to, really not seeing that kind of a big of an impact. Um, but we, like I said, you guys are getting the snow, we're getting the snow. And it seems like, a, is it me or does it seem like it's a colder winter? It seems like it just seems colder. It seems like the snow's not melting. And, um, of course, I'm a, I'm a paramedic. I've been a paramedic for about 30 years out of Colorado. And these are the typical kind of calls we go on this time of year. And it's, I just got to share with you, because we're going to be talking this morning a little bit about some of the twisted side of what we see, whether it be in emergency medicine, whether it be emergency management. But we see a lot of interesting things. And we got a call to a, uh, a, a snowplow accident. And when we say accident, well, I was thinking, wow, those can be pretty bad, can't they? We're talking about a vehicle versus snowplow. Well, it wasn't a vehicle versus snowplow. It was a vehicle versus a man down in the street who passed out and literally scooted him off the road. And uh, we knew we heard he was quite intoxicated because he was plowed, right? I mean, that's... A, <laughs> hey, it's not going to get any better than this, all right? This is, this is what we're going to be... Uh, but actually, I, I did go on uh, a recent hypothermia. Um, this was an indecent hypothermia. And people asked me if he was dead, and I said, yeah, of course, he's cold and stiff, right? I mean, so, uh... oh, come on. I'm, trying... <laughs> I'm a cartoonist, by the way, if you haven't noticed. Uh, I do all my illustrations. Uh, I found one way to deal with some of the frustrations and, and uh, uh, some of the anxieties of dealing with emergency medicine that some of the best way to deal with it was just to illustrate things. So sometimes I'll draw something and I'll test it out on you. That's a brand new cartoon. So I just tested it on you. Is it okay? Yeah. Is it all right? You like it? Okay, we got some sick people in here. That's cool. Okay. But I'm, uh, again, I'm out of an altitude of about 10,000 feet where we work. Uh, I live in a, a casino district. I should say I work in a casino district, but yet we cover a 450-mile district. And um, it's interesting because... Uh, it's near South Park. Anybody watch that TV show? Got a few sick people here. And it's interesting about uh, uh, Cripple Creek. It's, it's an old mining town. They still uh, take out about a million dollars worth of gold every day. Um, and it's kind of interesting up there. But they also decided they want to become a casino district. So overnight, it kind of went from uh, mining only um, to what? Uh, casino. And we had to evolve as emergency medical providers. And so we had to change our star of life to this. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you. You must be an EMS, right? So the interesting thing is that my world is all about EMS, right? I mean, I work in a pre-hospital care environment, and, but what I want to be talking about this morning is what we have in common with each other when it comes to disaster management. Because I deal with many disasters. You deal with a large-scale disaster. And so this talk this morning, we call it, if, if life is worth saving, it must be worth living. And it's interesting, too, because I notice that sometimes when I go to conferences, I look at your other faculty members, and I look at their acronyms at the end of their names, and some of these acronyms go forever, don't they? And half of them, I don't know what they mean, okay? But they look impressive. And all I had was NREMTP, uh, and so I decided I just started adding N-D-O-A-S-S-A-A-D-D. And no one's ever asked me what that stands for. But they said, wow, he must know his crap, right? Well, uh, I'm going to show you what that really stands for. Uh, Mac Daddy of all smart-ass ambulance driver dudes. <laughs> and, and my business cards. My business cards um, for the last 30 years as a paramedic have been these people. Okay? These are the people I work with in public safety and public health. And so that's the world I'm pretty much comfortable with, right? 
And so a lot of my illustrations, a lot of my drawings dealt with the kind of things that I dealt with these kinds of situations. But somebody asked me, what, what about your collaboration with emergency management, with, uh, with disasters and so forth and so on? And th that puzzle was never part of my life. I dealt with heart attacks, traffic accident, another heart attack, stroke. It was pretty simple, really. It was a very narrow view of what I had to deal with. And like I said, dealing with these business cards that I knew, I felt comfortable with it. And we all got along, didn't we? OK, well, actually, we don't all get along all the time. But the idea is this. I train for what is. And what you people do is what? You train for the what is. The tsunamis. OK, you, tra you train for these. And so your job is actually, in my mind, more difficult than mine. Because you have to wait for it to happen. I work on what? We call us EMS responders because we respond to what is given us. And so we're, in that sense, it's a different world. And I was very comfortable in that as a, as, a, as a paramedic. You know, I just waited for that 911 call and did my thing. And I went down to uh, New Orleans, 2005, to an EMS conference. It was a national conference. And there were 5,000 EMS providers at this conference. And when I say 5,000, I'm talking about firefighters, uh, doctors, nurses, anybody to do with kinds of, uh, of emergencies. And of course, that was the weekend of Katrina. Now, I got to tell you, when I was there, my focus was on getting ready for my lectures and my presentations. And everyone kept talking about the hurricane. And I said, yeah, I drank quite a few of them. They're pretty good. Okay, I really wasn't paying attention to the national news. And it came to that point where my closing keynote um, just before this came in, and suddenly everyone pagers, you know, and every 10,000 pagers went off at once, and everyone starts getting up and leaving. And I went, uh oh, something just happened. Well, it just didn't happen. It was something that was heading our way, and I unfortunately was not able to evacuate, and so I rode out Katrina. And I asked the emergency medical response team if I could help and where would be best place to stay, and they said, You stay right here at this conference center, and this is going to be the safest place to be is at the conference center. And I said, OK, I want to do my part. I want to help. And so being from Colorado, how many hurricanes do you think I see? You know, and I'm thinking, well, I'm still trained as an EMS provider. And what is the worst possible scenario I could think of? There were 16 of us, and we decided we had one floor on the 16th floor of a hotel. And that day, we decided we were going to go out and what? Buy supplies. We were going to get water. We were going to get food. And another thing we were going to get was what? Money, because we figured that when things close down, money is going to talk. And we did all those things. You know, we got blankets, pillows. We filled our bathtub with fresh water because we thought that. And what do you think a lot of the people in, in that hotel were doing that were stuck there were just partying? They were drinking to Katrina, celebrating that all New Orleans is never having this. And we felt like we were on the Titanic the night before. And we were, we were very solemn and very quiet, but we were prepared. And again, we had no idea what to store for. We knew it was going to be bad when you see animals outside storing this stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, there were cockroaches. They were committing suicide outside. We knew this was bad. And the birds were even trying to give us a warning, right? And they said, yeah, this is what's heading your way. And it did. And, I, you know, I got to tell you, right now, through a hurricane, I never seen such a barometric change in my life where I went from suddenly... Uh, it's trying to stand up and suddenly getting extremely bad headaches in my ears. I mean, this thing was going to be bad. And I got seasick because the building was swaying so much I could barely stand. And it was at that moment that I realized there were people dying out there. And the next morning I took this picture out of my hotel window and I thought, well, it doesn't look too bad, does it? Little did I realize not that far from that area that uh, people were actually drowning and that they were inundated with water. And... It's interesting because I'm just going to tell you this story because the day before when I, we went to the grocery store to get food and to pile up, there was a police officer in, stand, in front of the store. And we thought, good, you know, we, have, we have some organized control here. And as I approached the, the, the grocery store, the police officer said, where do you think you're going? And I said, I'm going in to buy food. And he says, no, you're not. I had to pay him off 50 bucks to go into the grocery store and buy food. What do you think I'm thinking at this point? Now, this is not to say any indication of what New Orleans police was like at that point, but I thought, we're in trouble. This could be chaos, couldn't it? And 
there wasn't any help really. And it's interesting because the first night after Katrina, people came outside and they stared up into the sky. Of course, there's no electricity. And they stared up to the sky and they're just staring. And I'm going, are you looking at the helicopters? And a lot of them said, no, I've never seen the stars before. And I again realized we have people in the city that are completely dependent and helpless for taking care of themselves. And I saw great acts of heroism. I don't care what uh, CNN and all the other news uh, stories said. People were shooting and robbing. What I saw was compassion and I should say, being altruistic and helping each other out in these kind of situations, just like you see on TV on these normal situations. But resourceful and they were calm for the most part. And I also then began to understand when you understand of heat or humidity, 100% and 104 degrees, and you're wondering why people are outside, it's because the stench in those hotels and the backed up toilets. And people started getting to the point where they were really getting sick. And I really know that as a society, we're what? We're pretty helpless. We're not very self reliant. We don't take care of ourselves well. And we're not a very healthy nation, are we? Everybody know this guy, right? Remember when he first came on and what did he start talking about? And he called it not diabetes. He called it what? Diabetes. Okay. And I thought, well, that's a commercial. Now it's like every other commercial. It's like, have you ever seen this guy's cat, by the way? That's interesting. <laughs> I realized I was also in a group of people uh, or a society that was very unhealthy. People say, well, this thing keeps cutting out. These, things, these people could not go downstairs or upstairs uh, from the hotel because they were so obese or they had so many problems to deal with. And so I also realized that we had an issue here of what? Okay. That we also have a very sick nation in dealing with these things. And I know this nation is getting fat. I mean, we have bariatric uh, ambulances right now. And you think we have it bad. You should see Canada's bariatric ambulances. <laughs> But we were dealing with short-term thinkers in a world of long-term consequences, weren't we? And I realized also, for you in emergency management, what? That you have to deal with the people that are pretty much helpless. And they don't listen, do they? They don't prepare. They don't prepare. And that is your job, is to help them in that situation. One of the saddest things I had to see is people... You know, these were lecture halls where we were lecturing two days before, and now we're putting dead bodies in those rooms. Because this man didn't have his insulin or he didn't have his heart medication or hypertension medication. And, and so it became a situation here where I realized there's so much more to this whole thing. And I started thinking back, you know, a long time our ancestors, of course, were very self reliant weren't they? And even in the early 60s, the early 60s, you know, I, um, uh, I, I'm aging myself here, but we used to do that, what? Remember that? Some of you might remember that. Or you even have shelters. You know what was good about the Cold War? It told America to prepare. And maybe not necessarily now for a nuclear war, but to prepare what? To be self-reliant. And, and sometimes I think that's something that we also need to work on. And I found this first aid book from the Cold War. And I want you to see it because it's kind of interesting. Take cover in a basement, shelter zone, subway, unexpectedly caught, okay? Drop flat. Um, it all kind of makes sense. Bury face and arms. Hide your eyes in the crook of your elbow to protect yourself from flash burns. Okay? That's kind of silly. But don't rush outside after nuclear attack. All right? Wait at least an hour after the first blast. Beware, okay? And the last one I like, don't start rumors, keep your head, remain calm. In the confusion, you might start a panic. Really? After a nuclear war? Maybe, okay? <laughs> Even said something there about, you know, wearing a hat and having a, sh wearing a hat kind of might shade you from the flash of the, of the explosion. Really, it should say this. This is really what it should say, right? Put your head between your butt and kiss your ass goodbye. So planning for disasters now. This was something that was never part of my vocabulary. And I, interesting enough, several years ago, this is near Woodland Park where I live, we had a, a, a fire called the Waldo Canyon Fire. And it, this fire swooped down upon the city of Colorado Springs and burned a, a matter of 350 homes in a matter of two hours. And so suddenly this stuff was really becoming real to me of what these kind of disasters can create. And then the schools were finally happy. The fires were out. Well, then guess what? Then we had the floods in Boulder, okay, which inundated these mountain communities. And again, now we're uh, submerged. And so I watched all these resources come together. I saw everything from what you guys do, not only in Katrina, okay, but just the idea of getting food, shelter, water. How do we take care of the animals? How do we get electricity? How do we get those pets out of there? How do we clear the roads? How do we get electricity back? 
How do you clear those roads from those, those landslides and the road crews? How about the gas lines? What about the food and the maintenance? All these things start to mind. And so when I was given the opportunity to speak, I was, I was quite honored because I just personally want to thank you for what I've seen you do. And again, you have to prepare for what might be. And of course, this is very stressful, especially when you're dealing with DMORT teams and the military, of course, to this, creating a, and maintaining a strong normal while preparing for an abnormal. And that's what you do. And it's interesting because you know, when I go on a traffic accident, news media are there before I do, and there's instant fame, so to speak. Look at what those great people do. And you have to come in there after the fact and do the job with pretty much no thanks. No one throws a parade for you for that. This was a photo out of uh, Australia. They had some pretty bad wildland fires a few years ago. And this firefighter had been up for like three nights with no sleep and finally had to sit down while fighting this fire. And, you know what, I'm going to switch. Is this just irritating you? As much as it's irritating me? Okay, I'll take this off. We'll try something else. Check. How about that? Better? Okay, so they, this guy's putting out this fire, right? And the news media took a picture of it. And you know what they put in the paper the next morning? No wonder we can't put the fires out. And so you're not giving any slack, are you? 24-7, someone's running your ass. <laughs> you know, I know that feeling, too, sometimes if I'm working a 24-hour shift. I'm not the same paramedic I was at 8 in the morning than I am at 3 in the morning. If I go on a cardiac arrest and have to do CPR at 3 in the morning, well, my CPR isn't quite cracked up what it should be, right? And the funny thing is, you know, I talk to people that do the kind of things you do because, you know, you are given what I call a contributory life. There's two kinds of people in this world, those that take and those that give. And most people I know that do the work or any kind of work that deals with people, they don't do it for the money. In fact, if I said, can I see your piggy bank, I have a feeling this is kind of what it would look like, right? <laughs> We're givers. And if I ask somebody, what? Out of all these girls right here, which one do you think would work in emergency services, any kind of emergency service, emergency management? So which, which one do you think you would pick? I would pick this girl right here. Okay. You don't see the world the same way as everyone else does. In fact, you look at a roller coaster, and there's two kinds of people that go on the roller coasters. One are completely terrified, and one are having the time of their life. But the idea is what? That we, it's all about perception. And our perception is to do good in times of bad. And so it comes down to this is what you are and what I hope I am is that is a gift of contributory life. And so we treasure that connection to each other. However, the problem is we give and we give so much. You know, that's a self-portrait of me, just so you know. Uh, as a cartoonist, I'm allowed to exaggerate some details at this point. But no matter how much we give, we still have that focus of how do we take care of our own survival? And when I first entered emergency medicine, I had no intention of actually going into it. I was a teacher for the hearing impaired. I worked at Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind. And I always thought that sign language came easy to me as a baby anyway. So, in fact, I always feel like I should teach a little sign language every time I go somewhere. So I want everyone to, uh, okay. Take your left hand. All right, I digress. <laughs> but I was teaching in a classroom one day, and, and all of a sudden, one of the deaf students came into my classroom, and he pointed to his heart, and he did this, and this is heart attack, and he's pointing down the hallway. And so I run down there, and I said, well, I have an expired CPR card. I'll see what I can do. And I go down there, and there's a good friend of mine who's actually having a heart attack, and he's uh, in that situation where he can barely breathe. And I'm standing there going, I don't know what to do. And I always thought that was the worst feeling of my life. And maybe that's part of the reason we go into what we do. 
is because we never want to know that feeling of helplessness. That we want to have some sense of control in some of these situations here. So I watched the EMS arrive, and they did their thing. And I thought, wow, those paramedics are awesome. I want to become a paramedic. So I quit teaching. And this is what paramedics, I think, uh, think of themselves sometimes. But, you know, I bought all this stuff. You know, sometimes you'll see an, a medic, and they'll have, like, tons of scissors, stethoscopes, so, uh, hemostats, and all their whacker pants. They're filled with stuff. And you know why that is, is because when you come out of school, you have $1.50 worth of knowledge, but you have $500 worth of EMS paraphernalia. That's pretty much how it works. I even bought, you know, I don't buy a little pin light. I buy the mag light if I check your pupils. I mean, they can shrink you even if you're dead there, right there, okay? So I had all that stuff, and I had more importantly called confidence, and that's the feeling you have before you fully comprehend the situation. And I needed what? Experience. And what is experience? That's the placenta you twit. <laughs> when people tell me uh, they're very experienced in something, you know what I always want to say is, oh, you've made a lot of mistakes too. Experience is sometimes, I think, just another name for our mistakes. And so I learned some things. I learned, like, you never mask up before you enter somebody's house. That's a bad thing. And always turn a person on their side if you think they're going to vomit, if you have them spinal mobilized. Now, I'm telling you this because... I had a patient who was in a car accident, and we fully immobilized her spine. And you can't move if you're fully spinal mobilized, because we're protecting all the, all those uh, this vertebra. And but if you get start to get sick, I have to log roll you to the side so you can not choke. And so we're coming into the ER, and there's a doctor standing there. And he's a brand new doc. I've never seen him before. Now the nurses know that when I come into an emergency room with a patient, I never run into the ER with a patient. I kind of walk calmly and cool. But if I do come in really rapidly, they know that patient's either going to vomit, pee pee, or have caca on my cot, and I don't want that. <laughs> and so this is kind of this, un, un, uh, this, this, this unspoken language. Well, this doctor stopped me and said, where do you think you're going? And I said, well, I have a patient here. And I knew my patient was going to get sick because he's like, <clears throat> and the doctor says, I am the doctor. You're an ambulance driver. Just shut up. I make all the decisions here. Now, I knew I had to turn the patient at that point, and I have a choice. Do I turn him to the left where this doctor's standing, or I turn him to the right where the wall is? My partner on the other end of the board goes, don't do it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, to the left on three, one, two, three, turn him. He throws up all over the doctor. The doctor's eyes get big, and I'm just like, i got to protect his airway, man. What do you want me to do here? And the interesting thing was, that doctor did what? He was livid. I got suspended for three days with pay, that bastard, okay? <laughs> but things like this, I've learned that newborn, newborns are slippery. Okay, they really are. And if this woman's hard of hearing, do not tell her she has a cute angina. <laughs> I'll give you a few minutes to think about that one. That's all right. <laughs> Never cut a down coat while a patient is seizing. So this person's having a hypoglycemic episode, he's combating, he's fighting, and I have to cut his coat so I can start an IV to give him sugar in his veins, and, and, and his feathers are flying, and blood's flying all over the place, and finally I get an IV in him, and we're in route to the hospital, I give him the sugar, and just as we come through the ER do doors, he becomes alert and oriented, and he looks at himself, and there's the doctor who got thrown up on, and this guy's covered in feathers and blood, and the patient simply looks at the doctor and looks at himself and goes, I'm a chicken. <laughs> and the doctor said, go right ahead. <laughs> and that's called what? Experience. And so we learn things like that. And, you know, I was having a good time. I was having a good ride. I didn't care if I worked 72-hour shift. Exhaustion was my favorite hallucinogen because I got hooked on what's called adrenaline. It sits on top of those uh, kidneys. In fact, if you, you do this kind of work, you, you get addicted to adrenaline. Your adrenals love it. And you get that epi rush. You guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? Those tones go off. Those tones are something that could potentially might very badly happen. And suddenly you feel it. You actually feel it go through your system. And the interesting thing about it is why we get trained and what we do is, is to get rid of epi. Epi's bad. Because when you are really excited, you are not thinking about all the things that you really need to do. Well, after a period of years, suddenly all my stuff started, getting, uh, started going away. I didn't have all the equipment. I didn't have all the necessary stuff that I, thought I used to have. My new partner carried it, the rookie, and I just borrowed it from them. And so I felt now I had lots of experience 
and didn't need this stuff. In fact, I could walk into a room and go up to you sir, and go, are you sick or not sick, before I even have a conversation. I know exactly what's going on. I felt pretty good about it. But something happened. I kind of went from this to this. Is he gone yet? Suddenly, I wasn't caring anymore as much as I had. This is only over a period of five years. And, and so I decided, well, if I love EMS, I need to invest in EMS even more. And so I said, I got to have EMS love me back. And so I got more training, more certifications, put in more hours. And I suddenly realized that EMS and emergency services will never love you back. It will eat you up, it will spit you out, and it won't think another thing about it. And it, it led me to this of terminal professional burnout, which burns out people at just about the time their experiences might be of real value or leaves them walking around with resentment so deep they are ineffective. Anybody know anybody like that in your system? Well, it's funny how life gives you a teacher when you least expect it. And I was a 911 call, but we also have transport cars, uh, cars for people that just need to go to the hospital and get uh, treatments. And our transport car was busy, and so it sends me and my partner to pick this lady up for... Uh, a doctor appointment. I'm pissed off because I haven't had lunch. I'm tired and burned out. And when I go up to her room, she kind of gives me that smile. That's her. Her name's Wava Smith. And she gives me this smile and she goes, how you doing? And I said, great. Thanks for asking. And I had to. She weighed about 300 pounds. She had bone cancer, so she was very fragile. We had to immobilize her and get her down the stairs. I tweaked my back. Now I had back pain. I'm hungry. And who am I going to take it out on? I can't take it out on my partner. I can't take it off on dispatchers. You never piss off a dispatcher because they'll just give you more calls like that. So in route, I simply loaded her in my ambulance, and in route, I'm starting to do the billing and paperwork, and suddenly she pulls my clipboard down, and she goes, how's it going, Steve? I said, how do you know my name? She goes, name tag, dummy. And I looked at her, and I said, I'm doing fine again, and she just kept giving me that smile, and I said, is there something I can do for you? She said, no. No, just want to know how you're doing. And, and suddenly she goes, she looks, she goes, you know, I have, I have bone cancer. And I said, I know, I'm really sorry to hear that. Are you in any pain? And she goes, no, I don't need any pain medications right now. But then she looked at me really hard and she says, well, how long have you been on chemo? And I'm like, that's not funny. <laughs> and, and, and so she started cracking these jokes, bad jokes, horrible jokes all the way to the doctor's office. But it's funny how I started uh, smiling a little bit, smiling, uh, you know, cracking up a little bit. And so suddenly I put my clipboard down and now I'm engaged with my patient. And I'm actually sad that the transport is gone. And so we, we, we drop her off at the doctor's office, we're cleared out of there, and then suddenly I become depressed because I'm thinking, how is this woman whose days are numbered be so full of joy? And here I am at the peak of my career, I'm so unhappy, so frustrated, so angry, so I called dispatch, and I said, dispatch, I want to take her back. And they said, you're volunteering to pick her up and take her back? I said, yes, I am. And sure enough, before I could even lock her back in my ambulance, I said, how can you be so happy you have cancer? You're terminal. And that smile kind of, for the first time, dropped, and she looked at me, and she said, we're all terminal. Birth is a fatal disease. I said, what, did you read that on a Hallmark card? Give me a break. She says, no, I curse cancer. But there is a freedom I have right now because I don't care if my hair is messed up. I don't care if my purse matches my colonoscopy bag. I don't care. I said, and people like me don't need people like you caring for them. And man, that hit me hard because I went, well, well I'm, a, I'm an advanced paramedic. I have blah, blah, blah. I'm reading off my resume. And she said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And man, she had me. Right at that moment. She was right. I was like that. It didn't matter how many patients I carried in my vehicle. I was that flat tire. I was not the best person I could be in my job. And those words, I don't know where she got them from, but I wrote them down. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And sure enough, it comes down to this, doesn't it? As your vision narrows, so can the vessels of your heart that nurture compassion. And that can be in, true in our professions, can it be? and some of the stresses that we have to face. And so I decided I wanted to laugh again because this lady really laughed. And you know what? She became my mentor. She became one of my best friends. And every time she had an appointment, I wanted to make sure I was a paramedic who got to take her to these uh, situations. But she said, well, start inside. And I said, well, I'm not going to seek counseling. 
you know what, I'm going to go to a bookstore. I'm going to get a book. That's what I'm going to do. And so I go to Barnes & Noble, and I go up to the, uh, the guy, and I go, can you tell me where the self-help books are? He'd say, I could, but that'd be cheating. <laughs> you know we live for that every day, don't you? And so I looked up the word humor here. Humor. It's not about telling jokes. Most of us are lousy joke tellers. We can't remember the joke. It's actually a Latin term, and it means to be flexible. Not like that kind of flexible. But it also means to be fluid-like. Those are the two words I want you to remember the rest of this presentation. Fluid-like and flexible. And it's interesting because, you know, kids are what? Curious. And you have to be curious about humor. And for kids, it's natural, right? They're naturally attracted to it. And they're flexible. That's why, how many of you have kids? That you still claim, right? You know, I, when I was a teacher, you know, it's interesting because when, you, when your child's born, you want them to talk and you do the baby talk and then you want them to walk and they fall. And then when they master walking and talking, what do you tell them? Sit down and shut up. And in my classroom, it was like herding cats. But I would try to get them all calmed down and then sometimes a kid would be laughing during one of my talks or, or lectures and I'd look at him and go, what's so funny? You wipe that smile off your face. And here's one thing I sometimes I think we got caught on. We said things like what? Grow up. And we associated the idea of humor as growing up. And so humor is a tool. Well, just to give you an idea how some of these things work for me, I started incorporating it into my profession, regains perspective. You look at the world different when you laugh a little bit, don't you? You know, before we had GPS and we knew exactly where we were going by computers, we had to look them up in map books. And so I get a 911 call and my partner's driving and I'm looking in the map book and I can't find the address. And she's like, where are we going? I'll find it. A minute later, uh, where are we going? I'm going to find it. She goes, why don't you ask dispatch? I'm going to find it. I'm a guy. So I'm trying, I can't find it. So now we're like, Ugh. and finally she goes, why does it take a million sperm to fertilize one egg? I said, excuse me? Why does it take a million sperm to fertilize one egg? And I said, I don't know. She said, because they won't ask for directions. <laughs> you know, and suddenly I stopped and I went, dispatch, where are we going? <laughs> it makes you stop and think a little bit more about it. Provides grace under fire. Well, all of us are under a lot of fire sometimes. I had an intoxicated party. He's fighting. He's wanting to kick everyone's butt. And it's me and my partner trying to restrain him somewhat. And a police officer pulls up. And he gets out of his police cruiser. And he walks slowly up to the situation. And just looks. And he doesn't offer to help us at all. And we're like, you feel free to jump in. He doesn't say a word. The drunk looks at the officer and goes, your mother is a whore. And I went, oh, now we get trauma. Oh, this is going to be interesting. And that cop doesn't say a word. Did you hear me? You're... Yeah, I heard you. And I've been meaning to talk to my mom about that. And the guy went, you, what? <laughs> and that guy stopped fighting. And you know why? Because he was defeated. Because that's the whole idea, isn't it? I want to get you so pissed off, you're going to come at me. But no, he took that joke, laughed on himself. We easily walked this guy back into the ambulance without any problems. Robs us of embarrassing moments. If you can laugh at yourself when, you, when, you, when something bad happens or something silly happens to you, that's one of the best times. It relieves the tension of the room. You know, I had a gentleman I was taking to the nursing home, and as we're wheeling him uh, through the lunchroom, everyone's lined up to get lunch, and their walkers and their wheelchairs. And there's this one patient, and this aide yells across the room in front of everybody, Mr. Smith, your fly is open. Very embarrassing, very inappropriate. He doesn't flinch. He just looks at her and goes, honey, what can't get up can't get out. <laughs> I wrote that down because I thought that was pretty good. Bob's coworkers and patients. This is what Waven knew. See, folks, someday you're all going to be patients. Someday you're all going to need medical help. And if you make those laugh or make those who take care of you feel good, do you think you're going to get better patient care? Absolutely. It worked with her because I watched her. You know, one time I took her. She was still getting some treatments, and she went into because uh, she was getting some x-rays. And they were so busy at the clinic that uh, the doctors weren't really talking to her, and I'm kind of watching her, and she finally grabs a doc and goes, Doc, Doc, we got to stop all these x-rays. I heard you can get cancer from these things. He's like, well, that's not really pop. That's a joke, isn't it? <laughs> and you know what? He pulled up a chair and sat right next to her. And she just looked at me and winked because she broke his routine, not yelling at him, 
But just saying a, a little joke, because it bonds, tends to relax and relieve pressure. Well, we're on a car accident where an 18-year-old's involved. He's fine. He's not all that injured. He, he's going to be okay. But since he's 18, he's a minor, we have to wait for dad to show up to take him. And sure enough, dad shows up. But as dad shows up, the boy goes, oh, this is going to be terrible. This is going to be so awful. And I said, you know what? Your dad's just going to be glad you're alive. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. And before he could finish the sentence, that car pulls up. A man in a nice three-piece suit jumps out, looks at the car, looks at his son, starts walking towards him very forcefully. And I'm going, well, maybe this isn't going to be good. But the father went up to the son and grabbed him around and gave him this big squeeze. And I said, see, I told you it was going to be okay. And the boy's kind of rolling his eyes as his dad's squeezing him. And suddenly he lets his son go. And then he goes, everyone, gather around this torn up vehicle and we shall hold hands and we shall pray. And the son said, this minister, I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I, I got all day. Kumbaya, let's do it. And so we got around the car. And he yelled into the heavens. He goes, Satan has hit us today. My partner said, no, sir, I think it was a Saturn. <laughs> That's good stuff. You know, in a disaster situation, that is when it's the best time to use it. Because you know what? It allows you to what? Breathe. Humor is not necessarily, like I said, telling a joke. Sometimes it's just breaking the tension. And sometimes when you say something, it's just a little snicker or an inner thought or an inner smile. But you know what? It recirculates the brain again to start thinking. Consoles us for what we are, draws attention away from our upsets, and allows us for creative thinking. You know, it's interesting because uh, when I talk about creative thinking, most of the most successful business in the United States have playtime. And play is nothing more than humor and action. But it gets brain circulation to the right hemisphere of our brain, which is our most creative side. Have you ever tried to be creative when you're pissed off? It doesn't work very well. But the worst thing to be said of man is that he did not pay attention. And so... What we can learn from kids is what? Fluid and flexible is to look at our world from a different perspective. And I call it observational humor. That in disasters, when bad things are happening, that you can still look for the comic angle, believe it or not. Now, this was a firefighter who pulled up on this truck and took this picture. <laughs> That's observational comedy. Just looking at things from a different angle. I had this lady who said, please don't cut my, these are my jeans, please don't cut them, they're my favorite jeans. And I'm going, seriously? <laughs> we have a, uh, you know, on the way to the casinos, we have this road, it, and it's, it's kind of windy, and it has some cliffs in it. And this one gentleman lost a lot of money at the casinos, decided he was going to kill himself, and drove his car off the cliff, kind of like a Thelma Louise thing, right? And as he leapt his car off the cliff, Okay, we, we get there, and usually, you know, you see the car, it's pretty messed up, and usually it's a body recovery, there's not much we do, but as we're going down with uh, search and rescue, we go down into the mountain, and I see the vehicle, and there's no patient. Well, was he ejected? Was he somewhere else? Well, no, he was sitting above that car on a, a pile of rocks smoking a cigarette. And my partner went up to him, and, and uh, kind of, you know, checking him out, are you doing okay? And the guy's like, man, I can't even kill myself. I can't even kill myself. And my partner said, well, were you, were you wearing a seatbelt? And he says, yeah, I'm not stupid. Oh, man. <laughs> and you know what? You can't make this stuff up. And disasters kind of do that. You know, we get a lot of snow, and we had these deer that were going across this uh, deep part of the pasture, and one of them fell into the, uh, broke through the ice. And the news media got a hold of it, and they brought all the news cameras and everything, and the, our, our, our our firefighter water rescue team got in there and they pulled these deer out and everyone's applauding and clapping. And what do you think those firefighters did the next day? They went out and hunted it. <laughs> Irony. But one of the most compassionate things we can do for ourselves is not take our imperfections too seriously. You know, sometimes I did this cartoon a long time ago to tell paramedics, you know, you're not perfect. We, that's why we call it practicing medicine. And, you know, I thought I, um, I never make a mistake, I thought I did once, but I was wrong. And that's kind of how we look at ourselves. So laughing at ourselves, not taking ourselves so... And if you can work with somebody who has shares in that sense of humor, that's even better. Personally, now, I'll never work with anybody who doesn't have some type of good sense of humor with me. And here's a story I just want to share with you. This happened in, in, um, in Canada. This lady was about to deliver. Well, usually we deliver babies at home. 
if they're about to crown. And these men were in such a hurry to get rid, uh, get her to the hospital, they didn't want to deal with it. So they put her on a backboard, and they only put one strap across her chest. And there's three of them, and they're going downstairs, and suddenly that strap breaks free. Now here's a guy at the bottom holding that, 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 that backboard. And she starts to slide down towards him and suddenly stops, and her legs are wrapped around his head. And nobody moves, but they hear a muffled voice that says, if anyone asks if she's crowning, I'm going to kick their ass. <laughs> and that, again, is the stuff that, like, you know, sometimes we say things in situations. You know, we went on a person who uh, passed away in the middle of the night. Um, they found them in the bed, uh, unresponsive with no pulse. We pull up to the house, and it's very snowed. It snowed very hard that night. And my Amos got stuck. And while my partner's helping deal with family issues, uh, I go outside to see if I can get stuck. And a neighbor comes up and says, uh, I knew John was sick. Is he okay? And I broke a HIPAA violation. You know, I said, yeah, I'm sorry, John. John passed away last night. And so it was kind of quiet, and he says, is there anything I can do? And I said, yes, sir, do you have a shovel? Timing, people, timing on how you say certain <laughs> things like that. You know, and sometimes we say funny things, situations. You know, we went on a guy who coded, he had a heart attack uh, while he was getting his uh, uh, future read to him by uh, uh, this guy. And my partner said, well, you tell us, should we even bother? I mean, so that was good stuff. You know, sometimes when we're doing CPR on somebody and we're taking them to the ambulance, um, we'll straddle them. We'll get right between them and do CPR. And my partner, who's a very attractive young lady, uh, straddled him and was doing CPR. And as I was passing through the hallway, one of the other gentlemen in the nursing home said, lucky bastard. Okay? <laughs> and so what I'm trying to say is you've got to write some of this stuff down. This is stuff you've got to remember because this is stuff that will get you through these situations. Because like I said, epinephrine is bad. Epinephrine is created for one thing, fight or flight. And I want you to think about it. We're no longer being chased by the lions. But think about it. If the lion was chasing me and my body's trying to protect itself, what's it going to do? It's going to take blood away from what? My cognitive thinking process, because the blood needs to go somewhere more important, and that's to the greater muscles to, to run. And that's why people who have a very, as you saw in emergency situations, afterwards they do what? They shake. And that's because all of that blood... Okay, and all the, the neurons in those areas that went to the larger muscles begin to shake. It goes away from the fine motor skills. I don't need blood to my fingertips. I need it to the big muscles. So when you try to do a finite skill and you have epi rush, what do you do? Your fingers shake and you're not very... Your depth perception is wrong. Your pupils dilate. You breathe harder. Your blood pressure goes up. Your skin becomes pale and diaphoretic. Why does it become sweaty and all that? Because if I'm going to be cut by the lion, I don't want to bleed, so I'll take blood away from it. So here we have an instinct that was a long time ago. And that release of adrenaline is not good for our brains. We can't think clearly. We can't uh, process uh, ideas. We're hypervigilant. Our blood pressure goes up, increases our heart rate. It dilates our bronchial. We bleed uh, less because we take blood away from our blood vessels. Uh, fine motor skills are lost. All these things, I could go on and on. And that thing also includes uh, night vision, loss of depth perception, impaired vision, and all our glucagon stores, and auditory exclusion. And that's why we train. We go to conferences, we do these drills, all these drills you set up for emergency management are for one purpose, and that is also not only know what to do, but to what? Kill the epinephrine. Because if I do it enough times, and I train enough times, I don't have to think about it, and it becomes what? Like an orchestra. You know, I, I know myself on a scene, if it's going really well and I have a good crew, is that sometimes we can run a whole call and barely say another word to each other because we know exactly what the other person is going to do. He deserves paradise who makes his companions laugh. That's the Quran. A merry heart doeth good medicine, but a rigid spirit dryeth the bones is proverbs. We've got to practice joy and laughter. The path to service is a Buddhist canon. When we call to account for every promised thing he might have enjoyed but did not is the Talmud. Notice all the religions of the world, regardless of the turmoils we're seeing right now, all of them agree that humor, laughter, and joy is a path we should follow. And even Donald Rumsfeld said, I believe what I said yesterday, I don't know what I said, but I know what I think, and I assume it is what I said I think. <laughs> so even in disasters, things I noticed in Katrina, you start to see people use what? Humor. As a coping mechanism through these hard times. Or just taking pictures of, of funny situations that they noticed. 
And even Abraham Lincoln said, Gentlemen, why don't you laugh at the fearful strain that is upon me night and day? I did not laugh, I should die. You need this medicine as much as I. And notice he called laughter medicine. Why don't we call it? Why don't, why, in fact, I often times, why don't we use humor more in medicine? And I think it's because we can't charge you for it. I think that's what it comes down to. But humor does. It drops your blood pressure. It actually goes, like I said earlier, it gets blood circling to your creative side of your head. And so if we know all these things about humor are good for us, why don't we practice it like we should? Well, I think it comes down to, again, like I was talking about being a teacher. How many of you had a teacher uh, like that? If I was to ask you who was your favorite teacher or instructor you've ever had, if, I would be very surprised if you didn't add in there they made me laugh or they made me smile or they knew how to have a good time in a learning situation. So I want you to look at this EKG, but I don't want you to look at it as an EKG, EKG. I want you to look at it as your emotional EKG. All those spikes going up are your positive emotions, happiness, joy, laughter. All the spikes below the line are negative, sadness, grief. And this is life, isn't it? You have your emotional EKG that has ups and downs as you go along here. What do you think a, a child's EK, uh, emotional EKG would look like? Well, like that. Because when kids feel, they feel, don't they? They don't know how to postpone the emotions. And it's interesting because my daughter had this gerbil. His name was Jib Jib. And when your child wants a gerbil, you hope it lives how long? A week or two. That's what I'm going for. Well, Jib Jib lived two friggin' years, all right? And in that time, Jib Jib had lots of toys and lots of things. And my daughter became very, uh, I was very proud of her. She took very good care of Jib Jib, obviously. But that night came where Jib Jib was going to die. And I stayed up all night with my daughter. And the reason I did that was because this was the first loss my daughter was going to experience of something she loved and cared for. And so I wanted it to be important for her. So it, was, it wasn't the fact that it was a gerbil. It was just the symbolism behind it. Well, Jib Jib didn't die. That friggin' thing stayed alive all night. And I had to go to work the next day. And the minute I got to work, I get a phone call from my daughter. And she's crying because what? Jib Jib died. Well, we weren't too far from my house at that time on my ambulance. And I asked dispatch, you mind if I just drive by the house and, and, and do this little ritual with my daughter? She wants to bury Jib Jib. <laughs> okay. It's quiet. Go ahead and do that. And so I told my daughter to put all Jib Jib's favorite toys and all his paraphernalia in a box. And we'd be, when I'm thinking it was going to be a little box, well, it was actually like a big VCR box. It was huge. And so we get on uh, to the house, and we start digging. And I noticed this is a bad thing PR-wise. When people drive by and see an ambulance digging a grave, just so you know, it really doesn't look all that great. And so my daughter gave this tearful. I actually got choked up about Jib Jib. And she started crying and crying, and finally I said, dear, let it go. And she said, Dad, how can I go if I don't feel it first? I want you to think about that. How can I let it go if I don't feel it first? My job, everything I did in my profession was about what? My emotional EKG as a paramedic was what? I would get the stimulus for the call, but I'm never allowed to feel. Because I'm a medical professional. The funny thing is, when you decide you're not going to feel the negative, what do you think that does, paradoxically, to the positive spikes? It takes that away. If you say, I'm not going to feel the bad, I guarantee it's going to impact feeling the good. And so it narrows. Part of that was from my growing up. My dad was uh, the youngest of nine brothers. Okay? He grew up tough. And I never seen my dad show any kind of emotion, any kind of feelings. And maybe I modeled a little bit about that. And I remember this because, you may remember this show, what is, what's it called? Brian's Song. And it was one of the first TV shows that actually showed cancer of, of, of someone who's very famous who died. And um, there's a scene where he's just about to die. And I, I look over at my dad, I see a tear coming down his eye. I'm like, Dad, are you crying? He goes, no. And he gets up and he goes, I said, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to go uh, mow the lawn. And I said, Dad, there's three feet of snow on the ground. He goes, shut up. <laughs> It, it, it touched me in that sense that I realized that even my dad, even my dad could feel. But being in the professions you and I share, this is our emotional EKG. We're not allowed to feel anything, so we can't feel the good. But by feeling is feelings. And when you cut yourself up by feeling bad, by suppressing or ignoring your pain, you may also cut yourself off from feeling good. Feeling the bad is also part of the ride. 
I mean, I remember coming home from a call, maybe a Sid's death, and I would just sit in front of the TV, not even turn it on, and just stare at the blank screen. I felt nothing. I didn't feel sadness. I didn't feel goodness. I felt absolutely nothing. And so you build a wall. You build a wall around those you love and the people you care for. And you quickly realize that we are the enemy ourselves. I mean, how many of you would call an ambulance for yourself? I'm just curious. Do we suck that bad? I mean, what was that? I think it's, they actually did a study. Healthcare professionals, when they're having chest pain, the average citizen for chest pain will call 911 within an hour. The average healthcare provider will wait two hours, even though we know all the signs and symptoms. I think there's a part that we're supposed to take care of everyone else, and no one else is, we're not supposed to take care of ourselves. And the only time we're allowed to feel is when we lose one of our own. And even then, I look at that gentleman right there fighting so hard to fight back what his heart is telling him. But you feel sad because every person's loss is also your loss. It's normal, necessary, a good sign that you care and proof that you are emotionally alive. And like I said, there was this one call. We went on uh, south of Colorado Springs. And it was icy condition, black ice. Uh, helicopter couldn't fly. We knew it was bad. Volunteers on scene are screaming, where's the ambulance? We have a critical patient here. And we're driving 10 miles an hour for, uh, for 15 miles. And so we're very anxious. We pull up on scene. And this gentleman was uh, coming home from work and his lost control of his truck and was ejected. Okay? And as we pull up on scene, the, the rescuers are putting him on a backboard. I know they're rolling him onto a backboard, but I noticed there's no structure to his thorax. It's like jello. He had crushed every single bone in his chest, which is usually a mortal wound, obviously. And I thought, well, he's dead. And when I went up to check a pulse, suddenly that gentleman opened his eyes and looked at me and he said, and I'm like, no, shit. <laughs> oh, my God. Not only is he alive, he's conscious, he's alert, he knows what's going on. And now we have to, what, drive this gentleman 10 miles at 10 miles an hour back to the city. And I know his wounds are lethal. There's no way he's going to survive this. And yet, as I get him in the back and I'm trying to do all the things I think I need to do to help him, put tubes in his chest, put a tube into his lungs, he says, don't let me die. Today's my birthday. I want to see my children. And I'm going, in my mind, shut up, shut up. Your thoracic trauma, nothing more right now. Well, he did die. He died about 10, 5 miles out of Colorado Springs. And suddenly, the volunteer who was with me says, what do we do now? And before I could even answer him, these tears were coming down, hitting this man's chest. And I've never done that before. And I felt embarrassed and, 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 and mad about it. And so I finally... Um, get my stuff together because we're pulling to the emergency room and I already uh, talked to the hospital saying we're coming in with a critical. But I called him up and I said, cancel trauma team, DOA, be there in five. Well, as we get to the hospital, the back bay door opens and there's like four nurses, three doctors, four paramedics, chaplain, all these people. And I'm like, why are you all here? I canceled you. And he said, we're not here for him. We're here for you. It must have heard in my voice, the crackling or something, but they knew at that moment I was in a deep pain. And so I, that was the gift I learned from Weva. You can laugh, you can cry, and you can also know that you have the support of your peers. And you know what was great about that is they didn't say anything to me. I call it the kind presence because they just gave me the look of we know. And sometimes, folks, you can help your peers by just being there. Not giving advice, but just giving them what? your attention to the moment. Because we have to depend on each other. You know, some of these horrendous shootings that have been going on recently, especially one in Paris. I talked to a brand new medic who said, oh, I wish I was there to be part of that. And I said, those medics, those rescuers, are destroyed for the rest of their lives. They will never survive this. You do not wish you were there. And we're going to see more of it. So you need, we need each other, folks. Friends help boost the immune system. Unless, of course, you're sharing needles with them. Okay. Now, I'm not saying in my situation I'm going to give my, my team a group hug every time someone misses an IV. That's not my point here. But I do know that, that we have to recover part of our souls. And some of these calls that you're going to be going on, some of these things that you manage, everything you prepare for, and suddenly it comes to head, then you are dealt with the reality of what? Not just the mental capacity of what you had to create, but now what your spirit has to face and confront. 
I drew this cartoon right after Columbine, thinking this might be the last time I have to draw anything like this. Then there was Oklahoma City. Then there was 9-11. And now I've stopped drawing it because it's just too painful. I thought Virginia Tech would be the last one. And now it's, it's constant. You know, right out of Columbine shooting, a SWAT team member, one SWAT team member was quoted as saying as he came out, they never give us enough body armor for the soul. And so we're kind of addressing this because I think, like I said, when we have a bad call, what do we have a tendency to do is we tend to ignore it. And I want you to think of that as a runner who sprains his, uh, maybe his hamstring or whatever. And so he ignores it. And what does he do? He runs out even more to try to forget and only becomes disabled to that point. So as we wrap this up, Karis Muhammad Atta said, the time for laughter in America is over when the nine, uh, Twin Towers fell. And being a cartoonist, I looked at the cartoons that came out following that. And the first cartoon, uh, political cartoon I saw was obviously what? Grief, sorrow, sadness. And then a week later was what? Anger at those who had done such harm. But then I saw this cartoon, Holy War. Holy crap. <laughs> and you know what? That's when I knew we were going to be okay. Because we defeated them with our ability to laugh, to sustain us during those hard times. And then we laughed at ourselves. I, he said Aflac, not Anthrax. <laughs> Somebody said, can you laugh at any given moment of a disaster? And uh, um, a fireman raised his hand. I was in New York City giving a presentation. He goes, I laughed when Tower 2 was coming down. And everyone just stopped and looked at him. And he said, when Tower 2 was coming down, at that moment, it doesn't matter if you're a rescuer or a civilian. It doesn't matter. You're running for your life. And we are all running, everybody. And we're looking behind us. And I'm running. And I'm looking at this lady next to me. And she's looking behind her. And she suddenly runs into a mailbox. Wham! And she falls down. And again, there's dead silence in the room. And he goes, well, this is what struck me funny. She got up and looked around to see if anyone noticed that she ran into the mailbox. <laughs> that even at that moment, her vanity was more important than the events that were just unfolding in front of the entire world. And he said, I knew I was going to be okay. For some reason, I knew at that moment I was supposed to see that. And so... Training to focus your mind on the funny, not the fatal, can help you heave in open wounds. And even Viktor Frankl, uh, Frankl, who was in a concentration camp during World War II, said, humor more than anything else in the human makeup can afford an aloofness and ability to rise above any situation, if only for a few seconds. So remember that sometimes that humor in these situations you may be placed in may only last a few seconds. But see, I love this picture because this is a picture of what? Hope. Because even... The day after 9-11, children were doing what? Play. And again, play is nothing more than humor and action. So last story, I promise. We had this boy. Um, he's on dialysis. He's in a hospital, but for some reason, his insurance required him to actually go to a dialysis treatment instead of getting dialysis in the hospital. So sometimes you would transport him, sometimes you wouldn't during the week. And usually his mother would ride along and... I'm in the back of the ambulance, my partner's driving, mother's up front, and we're en route to dialysis, and the boy's looking out the window and he's excitedly saying, there's one, there's another one. He's really excited, there's another one. And I'm going, son, what's, what's getting you all rattled up? He goes, look at all those unhelmeted motorcycle riders. And I'm looking at him again, he goes, I need two new kidneys, damn it. And I started laughing, and my partner started laughing, and the mother turned around and said, that's not funny. And the boy, he was great, he goes, Mom, shut up. I like emergency people. They see me, not my disease. And they know how to laugh, because I'm sick, but I'm still who I am. And he didn't say in those exact words, but the meaning was very clear. And so there was kind of this silence. And my partner said, well, there's one over there. Do you want me to hit him? And so in those times, remember that humor, to have a sense of humor is to have an understanding of human suffering and misery. And so even when we start dealing with some of the survivors of these great disasters and you're in care of them for even a brief period, usually when people realize that they're going to survive, that they're alive, look for signs of humor to give them what? Hope. Hope. Because hope and laughter sometimes go hand in hand with each other and humor drives out fear. Thanks for having me this morning. You all have a great time. I appreciate it.